Heavenly Father, we just thank you for giving us this time. I thank you for your word. It's alive. It's full of power. And I just thank you, God, that I know that I know you're going to minister to us tonight in a great and a powerful and a mighty way. I ask you, Lord, to please anoint me one more time. Please let the mantle of teacher come and rest on me, enable me to be accurate and clear with what it is that you've put on my heart. And I just ask you, God, open our hearts. And yes, Lord, open our minds to receive all that you have for us tonight. And we will give you glory and honor and praise for it in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Some of you bring notebooks, and that's wonderful. If you do not have a note, and it would be great for this series because we're going to do a, a, a lot of lessons um, pertaining to Your Mind Matters. If you do not have one with you tonight, perhaps you could turn over the announcement sheet, or there will be a scripture sheet uh, that's on your table that I'm going to get to in a little while. You might turn that one over and take some notes on there. The first scripture that I will refer to, if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles or your smart whatevers, is uh, the theme scripture for Help for Hurting Women, which is 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. So here we go. The title is Your Mind Matters. Your mind matters. Now, let me say right at the beginning, um, th this, this, and you'll see as it unfolds, this is a play on words, okay? Because um, your mind matters, which means um, if something matters, it, it has significance. There, there is some significance to it. But we also refer to matters as in matters of the heart, right? Or, or matters pertaining to a mission trip like we talked about. So things that we might need to attend to, things that matter. Amen? So um, why, uh, and I, I thought that, honestly, I have to tell you, I thought that God was pretty cool when he gave me this title for this series. I was like, yeah, your mind matters. And then the tagline that he really gave to me, you heard it in the video, you've seen it in some of the promotions, is that the Lord said to me, literally, he said, he said, Connie, you need to tell them everything in their lives matters to me. Everything in each life matters to me, including their thought life. And we do have a thought life, don't we? Not just random uh, thoughts. We have a thought life. Everything about your life matters to God, including your thought life. Now, why would I do this teaching for help for hurting women? Why would I do this for those that are hurting? Because the truth of it is, Sometimes we absolutely have peace of mind. And peace of mind is precious, and that is absolutely what God has for us. It's what he has planned for us. Let that give you hope. <laughs> Let that give you encouragement. He has peace of mind for us. But sometimes there are mind struggles not just battles, but struggles. Sometimes there are struggles in our minds, especially with the COVID crisis and the chaos and the trouble that has come to minds out of it in unprecedented fashion at the church. We have had people coming to us who are so challenged um, in their minds coming out of COVID and the isolation and the loneliness and, and, and just, but uh, those of us who normally would say, well, I have a pretty healthy mind usually, I have not encountered one single person who has not had some level of struggle during COVID. Because this was just different. 
I mean, this was challenging. At times it was confusing. At times it was chaotic. And out of that can come trouble, right? Trouble. So before I, ident well, let me identify what trouble might look like, okay? Might be worry. We might become fearful in some ways. We might become anxious about certain issues of our lives or other people's lives. We might be sad. We might be lonely. We might feel helpless or hopeless, angry, confused, even tormented. Now you might say to me, well, Pastor Connie, all of those are feelings. Yes, but where do they begin? Yeah, they begin in our minds right? With the thoughts that come, with the thoughts that come. Second Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, our theme scripture for the ministry. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Who comforts us in, say it with me team, all our troubles. He comes to comfort us in all our troubles if we will let him. Who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So this is what we were talking about earlier with hearts being moved toward um, going to Jello, West Virginia, reaching out to those who are so hurting there and in such desperate need of comfort. But I just want to make sure that you understand that although you think the things that I men mentioned to you when it comes to feeling hopeless or helpless or angry or confused or even tormented, that they, they seem like feelings, they are all birthed first in our minds. Are you with me? You with me. See, what, what happens is the, the thoughts begin to come and then if they are allowed to take root, if they are allowed to have, make their habitation, let's put it that way, in our minds, then that begins to have even more effect in all of our being. First Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. From the New International Version, it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. And that word there literally means to make you whole. Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, holy. Sanctify you through and through. Set you apart unto God's plan. Set you apart from what the enemy would have for you, from what the world would have. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Listen to this. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, write this down, your soul is your mind, your will, your choice making, and your emotions. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be sanctified. In other words, come to wholeness. God has a plan for our souls to be whole. Can you say that with me? God has a plan for my soul to be whole. Amen? And that includes my mind. Can you say amen? Okay. I love verse 24 because it's so encouraging. Verse 24, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen? Now, listen to verse 24 from the Passion Translation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 from the Passion Translation the one who calls you by name, 
the one who calls you by name is trustworthy and will thoroughly complete his work in you. Can you say amen? Amen. God has a plan for us. He has a plan. The Greek um, word that is used in the New Testament for mind is N-O-U-S, nous, N-O-U-S. You can write this down. Our mind, it's the mental function of perception, the way that we perceive things. The mental functions of perception, understanding, understanding, knowing, judging, and determining. Determining, making an evaluation about something, right? You with me? All right. Our mind <clears throat> is also the seat of our imagination and our attitudes. Let me tell you, there would not be women planning a mission trip to such a needy area as Jolo, West Virginia, where they have recognize that there are those there, especially, I mean, there, there are women who have hearts for the women. The women who are so hurting, they've had such loss and, and are dealing with such grief. They would not be even thinking about going if they were not imagining that God had a plan to do something good, right? Right? And that starts literally in our minds. I am a huge fan of mission pre-trips if we're considering taking a mission trip to an area where we've never been because I see what happens. We go, we see with our natural eyes, but God begins to work in our minds and our imaginations start to work and we begin to perceive things and understand and know and judge and determine. But that's how it is with life. So tonight, as we begin our journey in this series, my deep desire is for you to know in your mind, for you to know, for you to perceive and understand and know and judge and determine and even imagine that the Lord knows everything about you everything about you because the truth is thoughts come if they're entertained if they're allowed to remain they make their way from our heads to our heart right and if they have opportunity to remain in our hearts the word tells us that it's out of the abundance of our hearts then our mouth speaks, right? And then from that comes action, right? From that comes our choice making and we take action on it. Listen, God knows everything about you. Look at Psalm 139, one through six. You have it. I gave each of you a copy of it. Psalm 139, they're on your table. Does everyone have it? Is there anyone who does not have it? Okay. This is so powerful. Psalm 139, this is a psalm of David. Consider David's heart. Consider the things that David did that were really good. And the things that David did that were really bad. I mean, just think about it. And yet God describes David as a man after his own heart, right? Psalm 139, 1 through 6. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. Everything. Verse 2. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul. Do you see the next words? And you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. Wow. This is the God who loves you. 
This is the God who knows you. This is the God who is not surprised by the thoughts that come. Are you with me? Okay. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. Now think, now listen to this. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. And look at this. And you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence, right? So he knows when those thoughts that he knew were going to come have made their way from your mind to your heart. This is amazing. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. That somebody ought to be saying hallelujah, right? And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? You have laid your hand on me. This is just too wonderful, too deep, and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings me wonder and strength. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. So, he understands my every thought before it even enters my mind. He knows what I'm going to do with that thought. He knows if I'm going to act on that thought. And I want to ask you to hold that thought because I am going to read something to you. I'm going to read to you from a book that is by Dutch Sheets. Dutch, D-U-T-C-H, Sheets. The book is The Pleasure of His Company. The Pleasure of His Company. And the subtitle is A Journey to Intimate Friendship with God. It is powerful. It is absolutely powerful. Now, we have just read this. God knows every movement of our heart and soul. He knows every thought before we even think it. He knows if we're going to act on it. He goes before us to prepare the way. And he protects us even when we've done it wrong. Is that not amazing? This is entitled, The Look. So I want you to consider this. We're going to talk a bit about Peter. But I want you to listen, and I want you to take this profoundly personally. Take this personally. Dutch Sheets writes, one of the things I like about the Bible is that God allows its heroes of faith to be real, choosing not to hide their humanness from the rest of us all too human earthlings. Pedestals are great for non-human displays, <laughs> but they're far too unstable to support the average human. There are worries concerning this when it comes to the scriptures. The Bible puts the average reality TV show to shame. Affairs, murders, betrayals, <laughs> failures. <laughs> he says all the zits are there. Simon Peter is one of those real life characters. I love his realness. A down to earth fisherman grinding out a living in the small town of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. Peter was probably a tough, calloused, hard-nosed individual. This outspoken disciple sometimes wore his emotions on his sleeve. He once rebuked Jesus, Matthew 16, 22, and later cut off the ear of the high priest's servant at the Lord's arrest, John 18, 10. And like many good fishermen, he was known to string out a few expletives, expletives when he felt it necessary. Matthew 26, 24, like any good carpenter with a raw piece of wood, Jesus could see past the knots and the blemishes in Peter 
to the potential within. Jesus thinking, I like this guy. He must have thought. A little rough around the edges, but great potential. He may have even mused someone pensively as his prophetic gift kicked in. He is so loyal, in fact, that one day he'll be willing to die for me. Follow me, he shouted to Peter and his brother Andrew on one fateful day, and the rest, as they say, is history. One of Peter's all-too-human moments came at the Last Supper, the night before Christ's crucifixion. Like many of us, he was a bit overconfident concerning his commitment to the Master. When Jesus spoke of his arrest and of the disciples scattering, speaker, it, Peter spoke up and bragged, I'll never run. I'm ready to go to prison and to die for you, Luke 22, 33, paraphrased. I'm sure Peter believed his level of commitment was this great. Christ, however, knew better and gave Peter the now famous, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. Evidently, the Lord wasn't the only one seeing the potential in Peter. Satan wanted him, and he wanted him out of the picture. Simon, Simon, Jesus told Peter, Peter, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when what you have turned again, will strengthen your brothers. Jesus already had the plan. Isn't this amazing? Before the thought ever came into Peter's mind, before the action was ever taken, Jesus already had gone before him. He already has the plan for us. This is amazing. Rather than being offended or put off with Peter due to his impending betrayal, Jesus was compassionate toward him. I've prayed for you, the Lord said, and because of that, you'll make it through that ordeal. The Lord knows that in the course of life, all of us will fail him. If he demanded perfection, where would any of us be? Jesus was aware of Peter's weaknesses, but he also knew that deep in him was a faithful heart, and he was determined to mine that gold. He's committed to your development and your success as well. He won't ever give up on you. The Lord's prediction concerning Peter came true that night. He did indeed deny Christ three times. I've always believed Peter's denial was born more, now listen to this, more of confusion than fear. And this is what confusion can do to us. This is how the enemy has used confusion during this time. Confusion disorients and leads to fear, which in turn produces loss of courage and finally paralysis. We're just stuck. We're stuck. Peter was experiencing all of the above. Initially, he was ready to fight for Jesus. A few hours earlier, when the Lord was arrested, he'd drawn a sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's slave. But Jesus had chosen not to resist arrest. What? And now things were spiraling out of control. Having followed Christ to his trial, he was watching the proceedings from a distance when three times he was accused of being one of his disciples. And by the time the third accusation came, things were in chaos. Christ was being slapped around, beaten, spat upon, and a dangerous mob-like atmosphere was forming. And what must have been a confused state of panic, Peter buckled under 
the pressure. And he said, I don't know him. He shouted, I don't know him, peppering his denial with bad language. Scripture actually says in Matthew 26, he began to curse and swear. Obviously, it was more than one expletive. I find what happened next very moving. Jesus was close enough to hear him. And upon doing so, Luke twenty two sixty one says, he turned and looked at Peter. We're left to guess what kind of look he gave Peter, but it certainly wasn't one of shock or surprise. After all, he predicted the denial. Another possibility would be that the Lord gave him an angry, condemning, I can't believe you just did that look. But knowing Christ as I do, I can't believe this was the look that he gave Peter either. Though obviously it cannot be proven, I'm reasonably confident the look Jesus gave this troubled and confused fisherman who had left everything to follow him was one of deep compassion and reassurance. Don't worry, Peter. I understand. And I still believe in you. Remember, I saw this coming and I prayed for you. Everything's going to be all right. If I'm correct to think that Christ had the presence of mind at this point to be concerned about someone else's well-being is amazing. One would think his response, if not surprise or anger, would have at least been something like, I'm a little busy right now redeeming the world, Peter, and things are getting a little intense. Sorry, but you're on your own. But Jesus was no ordinary man. Even while on the cross, one moment, he was comforting a thief. The next, he was making sure his mother was going to be taken care of. In keeping with his character and the nature of his earlier comments, I believe he gave Peter a loving and reassuring look. I also believe that with one glance, he saved Peter's destiny. Seeing Christ look, Peter was undone. One can only imagine the flood of emotion he was experiencing. In Gethsemane, he had just seen Christ literally bleed through the pores of his skin. Then came the arrest and the beatings. Christ's face and clothing must have been covered in blood and spittle. And now this, overcome with emotion, Peter fled the trial, and the word says in Luke 22, he wept bitterly. Think of his mind. Think of the emotions. The emotional roller coaster continued with the cross, three days of mourning, followed by the resurrection. As thrilled as the disciples were to see Jesus alive, however, things were not the same. He kept vanishing and reappearing, only to leave again. He was gone most of the time, and finally, Peter had had enough. All of this was way above his pay grade. We're not sure of his exact train of thought, but I guess it was similar to this. I'm no rabbi or theologian. I'm not a prophet with the ability to understand mysteries and see into the future. I don't understand all of this theology and certainly not the events of the last few days. Nothing has worked out the way I expected. I have no idea where Jesus is. I'm going back to the only thing I really understand right now. 
I'm going fishing. He said to several of the other disciples in John 21, also confused and unable to connect the dots, they simply say, we're going with you. Imagine their minds. Imagine the confusion. I suppose it's possible these guys were just needing some rest and rehab, but I don't think so. I believe they were finished. Having gone home to Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, it doesn't take much imagination to think they were likely sitting around asking one another, so what do we do now? How do we make a living? How do we pay the bills? And finally, one of them stated the obvious, well, we still have the boat. Yep, answered Peter, and I'm going fishing. I imagine the Lord was sympathetic to their plight. He caused it, after all, and he loved them. Just think about your life. Take it personally. He knew if they could just hang on until Pentecost, they'd make it. So he told Dad, Abba Father, Holy Spirit, and Gabriel that he was going to make another earthly appearance. The guides could use another encouraging word, especially Peter. I'm going to go cook them breakfast, visit with them a while, and help them pay some bills. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. After they had finished a fruitless night of fishing, Jesus was waiting on the beach at daybreak. And when they were about 100 yards from shore, he shouted, did you catch any fish? The Lord knew they hadn't caught any fish. He probably caused their fruitless night so he could get their attention with what he was about to do. Are you taking this personally? No, they responded, still unable to recognize him. And he says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find a catch. John 21, six. Bells must have started ringing, reminding them <coughs> of an earlier encounter with Jesus when he helped them reap a great catch and subsequently invited them to follow him. Luke 5, with the similarities, they must have wondered, but, oh, no way. It couldn't be him. But they decided to give his plan a try, and sure enough, they caught more fish than they could drag into the boat. And John, now certain, said, it is the Lord. <clears throat> and Peter, now you just have to love this guy, was so excited that he decided to jump in and swim ashore. Why not wait until the boat could be rowed the 100 yards to shore? Nope, not Peter. Surely you can see his great love for Jesus. He was so flustered that rather than take off some clothing to make the swim easier, easier, he put his coat on and dove into the water. Impetuous, perhaps, but also passionate. Jesus must have smiled. He surely already had a fire going and food cooking. Come, have breakfast, he invited them. It must have brought back great memories to all of them. We don't know everything they talked about, but the pleasure of his company must have been wonderfully reassuring. Eventually, knowing Peter was probably still grieving over his earlier denial of him, Jesus began addressing the situation. Three times he asked Peter if he loved him, and each time Peter responded, affirmatively. Some theologians believe Jesus asked the question three times in order to offset Peter's three denials. Perhaps, but the first time he asked Peter the question, Jesus 
ask the question. Now listen to this. Do you love me more than these? Was he referring to the other disciples? Or was he referencing the fish? I believe Jesus was referring to the fish, which represented Peter's former livelihood and his former career. Could this be why he chose to meet them at the same location where their original calling had occurred and why he worked the exact same miracle? If that wasn't enough, he then gave Peter the same command twice as he had on that first occasion, follow me. He said to him, when Peter tried to deflect the attention from himself to John, Jesus would have none of it. If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Notice the exclamation points. These are indeed commands in the Greek tense that were written. Jesus was saying to this uncertain fisherman, your calling hasn't changed, Peter. I still need you. And it will be to catch men, not fish. Your failure didn't disqualify you. Listen to me. Not his thoughts, not taking into his heart, not his acting on it. It did not disqualify him. Mm. Your calling hasn't changed. I still need you, and it will be to catch men, not fish. Your failure didn't disqualify you. And the fact that I'm not around at the present time hasn't changed the plan. Hang in there. Everything will make sense in a few more days. And it did. On the day of Pentecost, Peter was born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. The Christ who used to walk beside him now lived in him. Peter preached that day and 3,000 people were born again. And a few days later, he healed a lame man known by the entire city of Jerusalem. And 5,000 more people were saved. He had made it. The crusty, foul-mouthed, impetuous, confused denier had survived his trauma and made it through the most confusing and consequential season in world history history. He came into the new era of redeemed humankind with strength and purpose, and you'll make it too. You'll make it too. If and when you fail him, including in your thoughts, and most of us will, look for the look. It'll be there. Understand the temporariness of setbacks. And when you're grieving and confused, he wants to take you to breakfast, not expel you from the family. Follow him. Can you say amen? Amen? Amen. Just bow your heads. I want to read you the prayer that's here because it's so powerful. And listen. I know that each one of us, when, when I first heard this, it so profoundly impacted me. I remember my past. I remember the thoughts that led me to the actions and what was going on in my heart. I remembered, but I also have a completely different perspective of Jesus now. He knows my thoughts before I even think them. He's already made a plan to bring peace of mind, to guard, just peace to guard my mind and my heart. He's already done what needs to be done to protect me from the harm of my past, those choices that I made, and he already has 
a destiny prepared for me. Father, I'm so grateful that you look past the external deficiencies and you search deep within, mining for the gold that's in my heart. Jesus, you were fully aware of Peter's weaknesses, yet you focused on the faithfulness that through humble love and compassion, you were able to see in him. Thank you, Lord, for your commitment to my development and my success. I stand amazed. You've never given up on me. Even when my mind is full of confusion and fear and failure and do shame, you lovingly whisper to me, look up my child. And with one glance of your eyes, I'm undone. Comfort, confidence, and new strength arise within me. Today, Lord, Tonight, I choose to sit face to face and stare back into your intense gaze. Identity, destiny, everything I need, I'll find in those fiery eyes that are burning with passion for me. I will follow you, Jesus, and look for the look that is everything. Heavenly Father, I just thank you and praise you for everyone in this room, everyone who's watching right now, listening. Lord God, how you know us, how you love us. You know everything about us, every thought before we even think it. And in advance, you already made a plan. You already made a plan. Heavenly Father, I look around this room. I don't know everyone in this room. I don't know everyone who's listening. I don't know where each person is in her heart, in his heart. But I know you. I know you're looking. I know you're longing for every life in the sound of my voice right now. And I'm just asking you right now, if you have never accepted this Jesus, this same Jesus, the one that we are told in the word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you've never accepted him as your savior, let's begin at the beginning. Let's begin at the beginning. He knows you and loves you and has a plan for life that is really life. Or maybe like me, Somewhere along the way, you made this decision, and then you lost your way. A lot of shame involved in that. A lot of lot, just difficult thoughts associated with those choices made in our wandering times. And yet, all the time, Jesus is saying to you, as he said to me, just look at me. Just look at me. Come home and let me have all of you, all of your mind and all of your heart. If either one of those is you, would you just raise your hand so that we can pray for you in this room? If you need to accept Jesus or wholeheartedly recommit your life to him, anyone in this room, all right. I know that others will listen and watch. And I'm just saying to you, just Jesus, come into my heart. I accept you as my Savior, as my Lord. My life is yours, and yours is mine. Forgive me for every way I failed you, just like Peter. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me clean and give me a whole new beginning. In Jesus' name. Now let me ask you, no one looking around, if you would just say to me, Pastor Connie, this is spoken to my heart tonight. The thought struggles. The things that 
are going on. I just want to have a fresh awareness that the Lord knows and he loves me and he has a plan to make my mind every bit whole. If that is you, would you just put your hand up, just up, God sees it, hands all over this room. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, you see every hand in this room, every hand in this room, including mine, Lord, because there are things coming against my mind where moment by moment and day by day, Lord, I'm just yielding. I'm absolutely giving them over to you, knowing that you knew what I would think before I ever thought it. What a comfort there is in that. So, Lord, we just say to you, have your way with us now, God. Have your way with us. Let us be profoundly honest with you, Lord, about our thought lives. Let us be profoundly honest, and let us absolutely trust. You already know. You already have exactly the look that we need, and you already have the plan to bring us to peace of mind peace of heart, and wholeness, spirit, soul, and body. And we thank you for it. Lord, I ask you that you will take those in this room to their places of rest with huge angels on guard round about them, Lord, that they will have sweet sleep and arise tomorrow knowing you've got this. You've got this. And we thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Amen. Can you give him praise? Can you give him praise? Amen. Amen. Again, let's just put this on here, Kelly. Again, the book I read from is called The Pleasure of His Company. The Pleasure of His Company. It's by Dutch Sheets, S-H-E-E-T-S. And trust me, Every one of the 30 chapters is phenomenal. Amen? Amen.